Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all this morning. Lovely that you're here at Raven Hill, especially here for the first time or visiting. Great to see you, and I hope you feel at home and welcome here. And if you don't know me, my name is Marty, and I'm the minister here. This morning we're here because we want to worship God. So let's take a moment of stillness together as we gather to do this. Our Father in heaven, we gather here this morning because we want to fix our eyes and minds upon you again. And we gather here today with open hearts, ready to receive your love and your grace and your comfort. We gather here with minds engaged in order to understand more of your truth. We gather here with voices ready to give you our praise and offer you our songs. We gather here to worship you our great God and King. So help us to do that with all of our hearts this morning, knowing that you're here by your Holy Spirit. May we experience your presence and power as we gather here in this place we pray today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hear God's word to us this morning as he invites us to worship him. He says, May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May the peoples praise you. Let's stand together and praise God as we sing praise to the Lord Almighty. say to those of us who follow you today, I no longer call you servants, 
Instead, I call you friends. Lord Jesus, we are blown away by this. Although you are the king of the universe, you are also our friend. Like the best of friends, you are with us through all the joys and sorrows of life. Like the best of friends, you encourage us when we're low and correct us when we're going off track. Like the best of friends, you listen to us at all times and show us grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. What a friend we have in you, Jesus. What an amazing friend that we have in you. And what a display of friendship you've shown us, Lord. You said greater love has no one than this, that he laid on his life for his friends. And we praise you, Jesus, that this is what you did for us. You laid down your life for us. You went to the cross for us. You chose to die that we might have life. You chose the cross that we might wear a crown. You took our sin into your death so that we don't have to take it into ours. What a friend we have in you, Jesus. What an amazing friend we have in you. Jesus, you are our friend, but we recognize this morning that you are also our master and our king. You are our boss as well as our friend. For you said, you are my friends if you do what I command. But Lord Jesus, we confess this morning that although we love you as a friend, we do often fail to obey you as our king. We confess, Jesus, that so often we choose to go our way and not your way. We're sorry for this, Lord. And we confess, Lord, that our sins today are too heavy for us to carry. Too real for us to hide, too cheap, too deep to undo. And so we would ask you, Jesus, to forgive us. Forgive what our lips tremble to name. Forgive us for our sin and our rebellion against you. Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your unending love. Help us today to rejoice in the friend that we have in you. What a friend we have in you, Jesus. What an amazing friend we have in you. Thank you for being our friend. Amen. Having confessed our sins, hear these words of comfort and these words of assurance. John writes this in his first letter. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world. What a friend we have in Jesus. He's died for our sins so we can be forgiven. Let's stand and respond to that great truth as we say, my heart is filled with thankfulness.
if you're unfamiliar with the Raven Hill Ramble, it's just a nice leisurely walk. But we get together as a church family, people of all ages and stages come together, and we just go for a walk, have a chat, enjoy company. And so that's going to be this Saturday, and we're going to Stormont uh, for a walk around the grounds there. We're going to meet at 2 p.m. in the Play Park car park. And so if you fancy a chat and a walk and a bit of time together, come along at 2, it won't be too strenuous. And we'll finish by watching the kids play in the park at the end of the day. So 2 o'clock, Storm and Car Park. Um, something that's not quite as enjoyable, but I'd really like you to do, is a survey. Uh, I, I'm doing a Doctor of Ministry degree, and uh, one of the things that I have to do is a congregational survey. And we were given a number of surveys that we could use, and I've picked one that I would love you to fill in, but I'm not going to lie, it's hard work. Uh, I said it's going to take you 15 to 20 minutes, it might take 30. Uh, some of the questions are easy, some of them are not, but I'd really value it if you would please fill in that survey for me. Uh, it's going to really help me with my research. So if you don't have internet access or if you, if you can't do it online and you'd be willing to do it, which I know is a big ask, and let me know and I'll give you a paper copy. But if you can do the survey, it will really help me out. Okay, enough said. I won't talk about that anymore until next week. Um, oh, this Wednesday night, uh, we're gathered in the prayer room to pray from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. We gather to pray for our church family, we gather to pray for our local community, and we gather to pray for the world around us. So on Wednesday night, do come out, 8 o'clock to 9, and let's pray together for our world and for each other. And finally, if you're a member of the Kirk Session, just a reminder that we're meeting on Tuesday night this week at 7.30 in the prayer room. Um, that's all of the announcements for this morning, but there will be a little newsletter sent by text later on. If you don't get that, let me know, uh, and I can make sure you get a copy of that, just with all the news of what's happening in Reefen Hill. Um, you maybe picked it up, hopefully you picked it up already, uh, from, from the prayer of praise, praising Jesus for being our friend. This morning we're going to be thinking about friendship, and we're going to be looking at the book of Proverbs, and some of the things that Proverbs says about friendship. But very often as Christians, we don't think a lot about friendship, and so I want to watch a short video, it's two and a half minutes, just to let you see how central friendship is in the story of the Bible. So let's watch this little video, and then we'll pray for our friends, and then we'll read a couple of Bible passages which teach us about friendship. Friendship is a whole Bible theme. You can summarize it this way. In the beginning, we walked with God in friendship, but then we walked away and now God's befriending us again. And this whole story flows from the heart of who God is. Before there ever was a story of redemption, there was God, eternally existing in a triune fellowship of love, and out of the overflow of his goodness, he created us, and he created us in his image for friendship, friendship with himself and friendship with one another. But then sin entered the world and fractured all of our relationships. Our friendship with God vertically was broken, and our friendship with one another was broken, but then from that point onward, we see God committed to restoring true friendship with both himself and with one another. And then throughout the Old Testament, we see God committing to restoring true friendship. We see glimpses of the restoration of friendship with himself. So we see people like Enoch and Noah walking with God, and that's a phrase that's a metaphor for friendship. Abraham is explicitly called a friend of God. Moses, the Bible says, spoke with God face to face as a man speaks with a friend. We also see glimpses of restored friendship at a horizontal level. We think of David and Jonathan and Ruth and Naomi. But as the storyline of the Bible progresses, we see Israel spiraling downward. They've fundamentally rejected God and that they've rejected one another as true friends as well. And so the Old Testament ends with a longing that we could say is in a sense a longing for the restoration of the lost friendship from Eden. And then when we turn to the New Testament, we see Jesus enter the scene as the great friend of sinners, befriending sinners, eating with sinners, restoring people to God. And we see him doing this through an act of friendship. He said, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So Jesus is laying down his life for people in friendship to bring them back into relationship with God. And so now as those who trust in Jesus, we find ourselves not only restored in friendship with God, but we're now in a community of people who are also friends of God, and now we have great potential for friendship with one another. We also have a mission to invite people to be reconciled to God in friendship. And then as we look out ahead in the future, into, into the future world to come, we see a new creation where we'll be forever with our great friend and all of his friends and our friends now. And so the future is a world of friendship. So before there ever was a world, there was friendship in a sense with God. And our future eternal life will be a world of friendship 
and then friendship itself is a thread woven through the pages of Scripture. Friendship, the, story is a, the Bible is a story of friendship. We're going to take some time now to pray for our friends. Specifically, we're going to pray for some of our friends who may be wandering from Jesus at this time. We're then going to pray for some of our friends who may be sick at this time. And then we're going to pray for our friends within our church family. So let's take a few moments and pray. <coughs> Lord Jesus, as we gather here this morning, we're aware of some of our friends who have wandered away from Jesus or are in the process of wandering away. They're being drawn back to their old way of life and they have forgotten their commitment to Christ and the love that he has for them and the joy of following him. Father, we don't really know what to say to them we don't know how to help them. And our heart breaks as we see them drifting further and further away from you. And so Lord, we would ask that in your grace and in your mercy that you would help in this time of need. Would you look down on our dear friends who are wandering and would you reach down and would you turn their hearts back to you? Oh Lord, for the story of the prodigal son, we know that it must grieve you. It must grieve you more than it grieves us to see your people walk away from you. And so we pray that by your grace that you would do whatever it takes to draw them back to yourself. Father, this morning as we sit here, we also have many friends who are sick just now. Some very, very sick. Lord, we recognize this morning that you know better than us the difficulties and the problems that they're facing. And so we pray, Lord, that in this time of distress and pain and sickness, that you would help them to turn to you and that you would surround them with your comforting arms of blessing. Would you pour into their hearts peace that passes understanding? And Lord, would you stretch out your healing hands to them? Would you reach out and flood healing into their broken body? Lord, would you bring wholeness to them again? Lord, we praise you that no matter what the outcome may be, your grace is sufficient for all of their needs and that your love for them is never ending. Comfort and bless our dear friends who are sick just now. And may they know with deep assurance that you're in control and that nothing can happen of which you're unaware. Heavenly Father, your word tells us that it is good when brothers and sisters live together in unity. And Lord, thank you that we as a church are united. United in our love for Christ. United in our desire to reach people for him. United in our worship. United in our love for you. Lord, we pray that as a church that you would help us to develop and deepen our friendships with one another. We ask that you would help us to be there for one another and to support each other through the most difficult times that we face in life. Father, I would pray that as we come into this place Sunday by Sunday, that if we're dying, we would be picked up by the words of a friend. If we're struggling, that we would find an ear to listen. That no matter what we're going through, that we would find friends in this place. Lord, thank you that this is a friendly church. But Lord, our desire is that this is a church our deep friendships are formed and maintained. Lord Jesus, thank you that you call us friends. Thank you that we can bring these prayers to you today and that you hear them and will answer them. Amen. Well, I'm going to turn to two parts of the Bible this morning. And unlike most other sermons, um, we're not actually going to look at these in the sermon because we're on the book of Proverbs, but it's hard, to, it's hard to read a passage from Proverbs about friendship because they're all over the place. So we're going to read two passages on friendship. And if you're in Forge and you want to sit with your Forge leaders, they've got a handout for you. Or maybe Forge leaders, you can come and sit with the, these guys over here. It might be easier. And they've got a handout for you. It's going to help you with the Bible reading and help you with the sermon to, to engage with them this morning. So yeah, if you want to come down, that's great. So the first place we're going to look is Job chapter 2, it's on page 510, so please do take a church Bible if you've got one in front of you, and turn to page 510, where we're going to read Job chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, and then once you've got that, put a finger in it, because we're also going to read from the New Testament, and we're going to read from John chapter 15, 
And so if you want to flick there with your other finger on that's on page 1083, and we're going to read some of Jesus' words there. So Job chapter 2, on page 510, and then John chapter 15, on page 1083. If you don't know the book of Job, Job is a man and his whole world falls apart. John referenced it last week. His whole world falls apart. He loses everything he has. He's struggling, he's suffering. It's just a terrible situation to be in. And I love the, what it says here about his friends and what they do. They do a bad job later on, but they do a really good job at the start. So let's read what his friends do. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Lamanite heard about all the troubles that had come upon him. They set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. And then I'd like to turn over to John chapter 15, uh, 1083, and we're going to read some of the words of our Saviour and our friend Jesus Christ. Jesus says this, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one in this that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. We're not going to look at these two specifically, but we are going to look at some proverbs about friendship. So as we come to do that, let's stand together and sing, speak with the Lord, making it a prayer that God would speak to us today through his word.
about some of the things that God says to us in the book of Proverbs about friendship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful book of Proverbs. These little sayings that give us principles of how to live well in your world. And when it comes to friendship this morning and as it comes to these Proverbs, I pray that you would just impress them upon our hearts. That we would leave here encouraged or challenged in the area of friendship. But Lord, give us ears to hear your word and hearts to receive what we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Proverbs, as we found out last week, they're little short sayings that get across one main point. And there's lots of Proverbs, modern Proverbs, about friendship. I like this one. There is nothing better than a friend, unless it's a friend with chocolate. I also like this one. Friends don't let you do stupid things. Alone. Uh, there's lots of little sayings in our world today about friendship. But friendship really does matter. Friendship really is important. Last June, the British government found it so important that they actually did a survey in Great Britain about friendship. And some of the statistics just show you that friendship is different for everybody. According to the research, a third of people have friends they don't really bother to see. Maybe that's you. A quarter of people say that they have friends that they've never actually met in person, only ever online. That's interesting, isn't it? Three people in ten say that they do not have a best friend. And 7% of Britons say that they don't actually have anyone who they would even call a close friend. And half of Britons 51% of them said that they find it difficult to make new friends. When it comes to friendship, all of us are different. Some of us have lots of friends, some of us have a few, some of us have a best friend or a close group of friends and some of us don't. Some of us find making friends easy and some of us find it painfully difficult. When it comes to friendship and forming friends and maintaining friendships, we are all very different. But I think one thing that we'd all agree on is that friendships matter. That friendships are important. Friends help us celebrate the good things in life, don't they? And friends are also with us when life is difficult and painful. Friendship prevents us from feeling isolated or alone. Friendship increases our sense of belonging and purpose. Friends boost our happiness and reduce our anxiety and stress. Friends help us cope when the traumas of life hit. Friends encourage us to change and to be better people. Friends also play a role in health. I was reading an article this week uh, produced by the Mayo Clinic, and apparently adults with strong friendships have reduced risk of depression, high blood pressure, and an unhealthy body mass. Amazing. Having friends and friendship is really, really important. And one of the things that I think we can forget sometimes is that friendship is a gift from God. It was God's good idea. Friendship is something that God wants us to have, that God wants us to enjoy, that God wants us to develop. Hopefully you, you saw it in the video, but I love it right from the start of the Bible. There's Adam. Adam has been created, and the animals are there, and the animals are great. But what does God say? God said, it is not good for man to be alone. And then what did God do? God created this perfect friend for Adam. This woman who he would share life with. This perfect, wonderful friend. Friendship is God's idea. And having friends is a, a wonderful gift from God. And so this morning as we look at the book of Proverbs, we're not going to look at every proverb on friendship, um, because some of them are a little bit irrelevant. Although I did read one this week that really hit me. Um, I was reading one, and it said this. It says, calling out blessings in the morning will sound like a curse. And I, that really related to me. Whenever I went to Union College, I have a morning person. And I would get on the train, and if I saw a friend, I'd be loud, and I'd be talking away, and I'd be chirpy, and my friend would sit with his head down thinking, I don't really like this this morning. In fact, my friend actually told me that if he saw me at Bangor West train station, 
He would avoid me if he could. Isn't that terrible? So I had to apologise to him this week. So if you don't want to be obnoxious, don't be loud in the morning in front of your friends. So we're not looking at all of the Proverbs, but we are going to look at three particular things this morning. We're going to look at God's wisdom for choosing friends. So what does Proverbs say about choosing friends? Then we're going to look at God's wisdom for being friends. What does the Proverbs say about how we can be a good friend? And then finally, we're going to consider Jesus and the best friend that he is. So let's start with the first one. The first thing we're looking at this morning is God's wisdom for choosing friends. You know, whenever you're a teenager, and there's some of you here this morning, I think when you're a teenager, you just want loads of friends, don't you? When you're a teenager, you just want as many friends as you can possibly get. You want as many likes on Instagram for your photos. In school, you want everybody to be your friend. And as teenagers, we, we just want to have lots and lots of friends. And those adults, maybe that's the same too. Maybe deep down, we just long for lots of friends. We long to be popular. We long to have a, an entourage of people who we can call friends. But God's wisdom is very different. God's wisdom would say that we should go for quality over quantity. God's wisdom would say that it's not important to have lots and lots of friends, but that it's important instead to have the right type of friends. And there are two things that God says in Proverbs that we have to consider when choosing friends. And the first one is this. We need to be wary of fake friends. Have a look at what these two Proverbs say. One says, wealth attracts many friends. And then the second one there, it says, many curry favor with the ruler. And everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts. That's true, isn't it? If you're rich, if you have a lot of resources, if you have a lot of money, if you're generous, if you give gifts, everyone wants to be your friend. But when the money runs out and the gifts are not given, they're away, aren't they? Think of the story of the prodigal son. There you had the son, and he got his father's inheritance, and he went off to a distant country, and he lived it up in wild living, the Bible tells us. There were parties, there were people, and, and he was spitting the bill. Sure, I'll buy you drinks. Sure, I'll give you gifts. And then all the money ran out. And all his friends disappeared. And he was left feeding pigs eating the pig food. That illustrates what God is saying here. That it's possible to have fake friends. That there are people and they might only want to be friends with you because of what they can get from you. They want you to do something for them or they want you to have influence for them or they want a favor from you and they're only friends with you because they can get something from you. God says, just be wary of this. Be wary of fake friends. You guys are teenagers, young people. I wonder are there any people you can think of who might be fake friends? They're there in the good times. They're there when you've got something to give them. They're there when you maybe have sweets or gifts or something for them, but they're not there in the hard times. Adults wonder, could we identify any fake friends? in our lives. Beware of fake friends, God says. And not only fake friends, but we also need to be wary of foolish friends. And that's what we see in the next set of Proverbs. Have a look at these two. God says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. And then he also says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Now, the fool in the Bible is the person who doesn't live God's way. A fool in the Bible is someone who hears what God says and how to live, and they decide we're going to go our way and not God's way. The fool in the Bible are often described as wicked people or sinful people. They, they have no interest in God. And they rebel against his ways. And Proverbs tells us that we're 
to think about being, not, perhaps not being friends with these people. That we're to be wary of being friends with these people. That we're to be careful about being friends with the fool. And why? Well, if you look at the first example, it's because you can end up being just like them. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one that eats the Why? Or you may learn their ways. You may become like them. Again, you guys are teenagers. I wonder what some of the things that your friends do that they might be enticing you to do even though you know that's not the right thing to do. Do you have any friends and they're always trying to goad you to do a certain thing or trying to get you to go a certain way that you know isn't the right way? They're always putting pressure on you to go the wrong way? Well, God says to be wary of them. And maybe not to be friends with them and maybe to pick good and wise people to be friends with instead of them. And then there's the other proverb, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. This is the idea that sometimes whenever we spend time with certain groups of friends, we can end up in trouble if we follow their ways. If we, if we go along with people and we go out with certain people and we do certain things with people, we can end up landing ourselves in trouble. And again, this is more for you guys who are teenagers. Are there people you hang about with sometimes and every time you hang out with them, you end up in trouble? Are the people you hang out with and you end up in trouble with the police at the end of the night? Are the people you hang out with and you end up in trouble with your parents at the end of the night? Well, God says that maybe these are not the type of people you should be hanging out with. You have to choose our friends wisely. Folks, I wonder if any of us here need to reevaluate some of our friendships. I wonder if you're here this morning and maybe you're getting used by somebody. Maybe you have fake friends. Maybe you need to readjust or reevaluate those friendships. Or maybe you have friends and, and they just lead you to the wrong places. They lead you to places you don't even want to go. And you find yourself in trouble or you find yourself in deep sin or you find yourself doing things you don't want to do. Again, maybe you need to reevaluate those friendships. Okay. So we've got to choose wise friends, we've got to choose good friends, and that's really important. But in the Bible, the emphasis is not so much on choosing friends, but it's actually the emphasis in the Bible is how to be a good friend. And all of us want to be good friends to people, don't we? We don't want to be terrible, terrible friends. We want to be good friends. And the wonderful thing about Proverbs is it tells us some ways that we can be good friends. And the first thing that we can do is to be gracious in our friendships. Look at what Proverbs 17 says. Whoever would foster love covers over an offence, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Let's look at the first part of that. Whoever would foster love covers an offence. Do you know what? Sometimes your friends are going to say really dumb things. Sometimes your friends are going to do really dumb things. And those things, they're going to hurt you. Those things are going to offend you. Those things are going to make you a little bit mad inside. But you see, whenever that happens, whenever your friend hurts you with their words, or they hurt you with their actions, or they say something silly, you've got a choice to make in that moment. And the choice is this. You can either lose it, get offended and angry and, and risk breaking a friendship or you can just come over it. You can just let it slide. You can just be gracious. Your friend has said something stupid to you, do you know, and instead of going off on it, you just think to yourself, do you know what, my friend is just tired today. And they've said that because they're tired and not thinking. Or my friend is under pressure at the moment and really stressed out. And they've done this silly thing. But you know what? I, I can just let it slide. 
There are times, folks, to be a good friend, we just have to let things slide. We just have to cover over the offenses of our friends. To be a good friend means that we don't pick up our friends and everything they say and do against us. But sometimes we just let it slide. But then whenever we do, sometimes, sometimes our friend might say something, and we do need to talk about it. But when we've talked about it, when we've resolved it, the second part of the Proverbs is really important. Whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. If you've sorted a problem, if a friend has hurt you and you've sorted it all out, or if a friend has hurt you and you've just decided to let it slide, then to be a good friend means that you don't repeat it anymore. You don't bring it up. You don't bring it up to them again, and you don't, certainly don't bring it up to other people. Because if you do, there's the risk that you're going to damage and break that friendship. Friends are gracious to one another. They cover one another's offences, and they do not bring them back up. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you easily offended by your friends? Do you fall out with people easily? Does someone just have to say one thing to you and that's you, the friendship's damaged, the friendship's broken, no more talking, do you hold grudges? This is not how to be a good friend. A good friend is gracious, covers up offenses when they can be covered, but doesn't bring them up. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Good friends then, are also honest with each other. I think that I was a good friend whenever I was a teenager. And the reason I think that I was a good friend as a teenager is because if I had a friend and they had either dirt on their face or a big bully hanging down, I would tell them. That is friendship, isn't it? That's what you do with your friends. When they've got a big bully hanging down or they've got a big bit of dirt in their face and they don't know about it, you tell them. You're honest with them, and they might be a little bit embarrassed, but it means they can wipe the dirt off their face and they can give their nose a good clean. And this is kind of like what it means in this proverb to be a good friend. A good friend is honest with their friends. They say the hard things when they need to be said. Proverbs 27 says this, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. And the idea of this proverb is that if there's something, if, if you have a friend and they're doing something wrong, or they're going off, or they've got a character trait that's rubbing people up the wrong way, or you can kind of see dirt on their face, it says that an enemy will just not say anything, they'll just keep them with kisses. An enemy will let them get on with it. But a friend will wound them. Friend will tell them the thing that no one else is willing to tell them. A friend will say the hard thing that no one else is willing to say. You have a friend and you can see that they're developing a drinking problem and nobody has said a thing about it. Everyone can see it, but nobody has said a thing about it. Do you know what a good friend will do? A good friend will say to them, listen, I'm really worried about your drinking. Can we talk about this? That's going to be a wound. That's going to be a difficult thing to say. But that's an honest thing to say. And it might be painful and it might lead to a difficult conversation, but it might just save this person's life. It might just save them from years of hardship, it might just save them from going down a road that's going to be damaging and difficult. Good friends say the hard things when they need to be said for the good of their friends. Sometimes when we hear the word wound, I can think of like a, a soldier, you know, in a battle and they sort of cut someone with a sword and they've wounded them. It's not that type of wounding. It's rather the, the wounding of a surgeon. A surgeon who takes his scalpel and inflicts a wound on someone ultimately for their good and for their healing and for their betterment. That's what a good friend does. Speaks honestly and 
kindly with their friends. I wonder as you sit here this morning, can you see any of your friends making a car crash of their life? I wonder as you sit here this morning, do you have friends and you can see that, that they are going off on a terrible track? Or maybe you have friends and you've noticed a character trait within them that you're really worried about. And you see it as bright as day. And you're worried about them and you're concerned about them, but you're just sitting back, letting them get on with it. Friends, Proverbs says that to be a good friend, if that's you, you, you need to go and talk to them. Don't go and accuse them. Don't go and tell them off. But do as the Apostle Paul says and speak the truth with love. Listen, I'm really worried about you. And you might not like what I'm going to say, but I'm saying it because I love you and because I'm concerned for you. I have noticed whatever it is. Good friends are honest. Good friends point out the dirt and the bogeys on people's faces. What's the next thing then? The next thing is that a good friend is there in tough times according to Proverbs. Proverbs says, do not, feed, do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family and do not go to your relative's house when disaster strikes. And this is this idea that if your friend is going through a difficult time, and you've planned to go and spend time at your brother's house in a different part of the world. You don't go, you stay with your friend in this time of difficulty. You prioritize them even over other arrangements. You're there when times are tough. A good friend is there through tough times. There's actually a modern proverb in friendship which I think just gets this across. And it says this, a real friend walks in when the rest of the world walks out. A real friend walks in when the rest of the world walks out. Sometimes we don't know what to do. Sure we don't. We have a friend and, and they're going through something really tough and, and we can't even imagine what they're going through. We friends and they're experiencing things that we've not experienced and we have no idea what they're going through. And we know we're meant to be there. And we know we're meant to be good friends, but we don't know what to do. And so what do we do? We just stay at home. We just think, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be a friend right now. And we stay at home and we stay away. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to go and to be with them. And I think Job's three friends do a brilliant job. Do you remember from the reading what they did? They knew that he was in trouble. They came together and decided they were going to go to him as friends. They went to his house. And what did they do for a week? They said nothing. They just sat there with him and they just wept with him. They didn't know what to say. They didn't know what to do. But they were there. And they sat, and they listened, and they wept. You don't need to know the answers. You don't need to know what to say. You can't fix whatever the problem is. But good friends are those who are there with others in tough times. The final thing then, and again, this is a big one, and this is a challenging one, but the last proverb says this. The next one, I forgot to put it up. Great sorry, Rob, I actually couldn't remember if I put it on, so I wasn't actually playing it wrong there, I just couldn't remember if I finished the slides. A, a, a good friend is always loving. Check this out for a challenge. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of mercy. But what about that first part? A friend loves at all times. A good friend has this commitment to their friends that no matter what happens, no matter what you say to me, no matter what you do, I am always going to love you. I am always going to be loving towards you. 
It's this idea of loving commitment, no matter what happens, no matter what you do, no matter what you say. I, as your friend, am always going to love you. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a friend like this? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a friend who will love you through thick and thin, no matter what? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a friend whenever you're in the lowest depths of life will love you in that moment. Whenever you're struggling and failing will love you in that moment. Whenever you're depressed and down will love you in that moment. Whenever you can't be bothered doing anything will love you in that moment. Wouldn't it be great to have a friend like that? Well, that's the friend we do have. That's the friend we have in Jesus. Jesus is the perfect friend. Jesus is the one who loves us at all times, no matter what. Jesus is the one who Proverbs called closer than a brother. Jesus is the one who never leaves us and never forsakes us. Jesus is the best friend that any of us could ever have. This morning, do you have him as your friend? Do you know him? Do you walk through life with him? Do you know his comfort in times of pain? Do you know in his certainty in times of maturity? Do you have Jesus as your friend? Because this morning you can have Jesus says that he laid down his life for his friends. He died for you so that you can be friends with him and with the Father and with the Spirit. Christ is the best friend we can have and Christ is what he calls you and invites you to be his friend. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're a wee bit uneasy about that. You don't like the thought of Jesus being a friend. Sounds too pally. Sounds too kind of childish. Sounds like something to learn and shine. And even though it sounds like that, that is what the Bible says. Jesus says to his followers, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Jesus specifically says that he laid down his life for his friends. This morning, if you've trusted in Jesus, then he is your friend. He's your friend. I wonder if some of you this morning need to, to broaden your horizon of who Jesus is. I wonder this morning if some of you need to recognize that he's your friend, one you can walk with day in and day out, one you can know, one you can enjoy, one you can rely on. Jesus is your friend. And I want to encourage you this morning to walk in friendship with him. I love it in the Bible, there are some people, and they're described as being people who walk with God. We're going to go for the ramble on Saturday, and uh, you're going to be walking with each other around Stormont. And as you walk around Stormont, you know, hopefully you won't, but you might trip over. You know, you might fall down. And what's going to happen if you're walking with somebody? They're, they're going to pick you up. Maybe after laughing at you if it's not serious. But they're going to pick you up, aren't they? When you walk with someone and you fall, they pick you up. Whenever you're walking around Stormont next week, you're not going to be walking in silence, are you? You're going to be talking with them. You're going to be talking with the person beside you, enjoying that friendship, enjoying the journey together. It's going to make the walk around Stormont even better to, to have someone beside you talking and walking with you. And this is what Jesus invites us to do. He invites us to walk with him through the journey of life. When we fall, to look up to him to pick us up. When we're in tears, to look to him to, to put an arm of comfort around us. To walk and to talk and to enjoy life with him. That's what we're invited to do this morning. And I want to encourage each of you to do that. Let's pray together before we sing. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the wonderful gift of friendship. And I pray this morning, Lord, that if you have said one thing to us this morning, that we would just take that one thing and focus in on it and work out how to live in light of it. Father, if we need to reevaluate some of our friendships, help us to do that. If we need to say some honest but difficult things to those we love, help us to do that. If we need to recommit ourselves to loving others, help us to do that. But Lord, above and all of that, help us instead to, to walk with Jesus and to enjoy friendship with him. What a great friend we have in Jesus. Help us to glory in that, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, and there really only is one we can sing this morning, so with, with just a few minutes to spare, we change the last hymn. So let's stand together and sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you today and every day. Amen.